you think Common Ground is worth a buck, consider leaving a tip at lptv.org. Lakeland Public Television presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. I'm John Parsons. More than 70 years ago, electors in this town voted a communist mayor into office. In this segment of Common Ground, we're going to try and understand what was going on. I'm Pam Brunfeldt. I'm a historian and I teach at Vermilion Community College in Ely, Minnesota. One day I was waiting for a meeting to start and somebody at the table said, we had a communist mayor. And I perked up, having grown up on the Mesabi Iron Range where communists were not at all uncommon. I thought, boy, this is really interesting. I've never heard of this. And I asked, them, asked the people who, what, who it was, and they said, we don't remember. And so I tucked that little bit of information in my brain, and I thought, I've got to do something with this someday. And I went back to grad school and decided to do some research on the story. And I found out it was a young man. His name was Emil C. Nargard when he lived in Crosby. He eventually uh, took the name Carl Emil Nygaard. He ran for public office in 1930, uh, lost, and then ran again in 1931 and almost won. He lost by about 32 votes. And after a recount, in which he still lost, uh, he continued his Communist Party activities. 1932 was the worst year for the Depression on the Cuyuna Iron Range. It was the worst year in general uh, for the iron mining industry in Minnesota. Um, in 1929, there had been a record shipment year. There had been more tonnage shipped from the three ranges than at any other time. And three years later, the bottom fell out. Uh, the Masabi, the Cuyuna, and the Vermilion shipped just two million tons of ore that year. That was about 1883 levels. So it was terrible. And then the banks closed in 1930, late 1932. So these miners who were unemployed and had been living on their savings in the bank now had nothing left. It was gone. So it was a desperate time for all of them. It was before before, of course, the New Deal begins to put money into people's pockets. And so I think one of the reasons he wins in 1932 is because people had lost enough hope that they were willing to try anything. I don't think it was like a radicalization to the left, as many historians might have looked at it in earlier decades. It's really looking at a social group, a, a collection of immigrant uh, peoples that were struggling, um, that businesses weren't satisfying all their needs, uh, their employers in the mines were so clearly not supplying everything that they needed right at the height of the Great Depression. And so they're reaching out to whatever organization seems to be saying, we will do something to help you, we will support you. And at that point, that included the Socialist Party, uh, the International Workers of the World, the IWW, uh, organizations like that. And while, yes, if you went through their rhetoric, it seems sort of extreme, in between there are the things I think that many of the people were attracted to, which were things about um, supporting each other, social wealth, assistance, and, and well-being. It wasn't all about trying to radically rewrite the society. It also was trying to support and help people. And that's really, I think, the message people were attracted to, both in the larger party and in Carl's uh, own messages. I think there are historians who believe his election is a is a historical anomaly because he ran against two mainstream candidates. Um, I believed that when I first started doing the story, but I no longer believe that because two other men who ran on what they called the workers' ticket that year also won with about equivalent numbers of votes to Carl Nygaard. That's no accident. Now, he's 23 years old. He's got a fiery temper and I don't know about you, but there aren't very many 23-year-old men who aren't going to be puff up a bit 
get a bit egotistical when they make national history. And so he tended to say things that he probably shouldn't have. He boasted about things that were not true. And so by the end of the year, the people of Crosby had had enough and they ousted him in a massive landslide. He ran again in 1934. Again, he was swamped uh, in a landslide and he never ran for office again. It's a fascinating story because it was not about overthrowing the United States government. It wasn't about revolution of any kind. All it was was a struggle for economic justice in a mining town. And he was, he just took up the banner of communism because communists were talking about the issues that mattered to workers, unemployment compensation, workmen's compensation, fair wages and fair laws, especially working hours and they wanted to be able to join a union and neither the Democratic or the Republican Party was talking about it. So they joined the Communist Party or became interested in the Communist Party because no one else was dealing with their issues. And so it's a story that matters because it's the story of ordinary people fighting against their own circumstances. I was just looking through this box of pictures and here was this picture of Munchie and, and it just said Munchie on the front. I turned it over and it said Myron Perpich. Perpich, there was a governor in Minnesota, Rudy Perpich. Well, I wonder if he's related. Doesn't matter. But look at this guy. You could, I could compare him in pictures to the other miners. His clothes were a little bit small. And it was like, this guy must be massive. Well, I'm going to paint this guy. So I cut him out, did all this, and I did it as a surprise to show them Carrie mainly. I said, hey, look at this. And I, I made him eight feet tall because I knew wherever they'd be displaying him that if I had him original size, it would look too small. And it was just a black and white picture, so that's what I made. It was black and white. And I did automotive, base coat, clear coat. It's funny because his wife told me, she says, I have to tell you a story. And uh, it's about Munchie. I said, okay. And she said, it's funny how when Munchie came home from the service, a big guy and everybody looked up to him and I guess he would drink a little bit and he would fight a little bit and they didn't want him in the Legion. So he was never a member. And now all these years later, he's what you look to when you come through the front door. <laughs> it's a fantastic thing. And I thought, wow. And, uh, so I, I didn't realize how much he meant to the community, and that's, that's just phenomenal. My name is Laura Eucara Lear, and we are sitting in the Lika Garden, located in Ironton, Minnesota. Serbian Sisters has been um, in existence for five or six years, and one of our initial missions was to beautify Ironton. So we had a garden in mind. When our grandparents were here, there weren't formal gardens because they couldn't afford plants as such, so they would have little sprigs of flowers by the front door, and that was just about it. So we decided to put a little garden in Ayrton to honor those people that were here. When we put these together, this flagpole and directional sign is we picked cities in villages in uh, the Croatia and Serbian area and Montenegro where people came from. So these were the small villages in many cases, very tiny little uh, hamlets where people were born and then where they moved to and where they left to come to America from. So we see Gospic, uh, that's where my grandpa boat departed to come to Ellis Island. Dunning Lopez is like where he lived. We have Apatine on the other side, Privy Put and uh, fa uh, Laura's family came from in that area. And so that's what we tried to do. So this was meaningful to people, um, where their parents or grandparents came from. And then the flags that we have flying represent four of the countries where people who are members of Serbian Sisters, their country. And so we have the Serbian flag, the Montenegrin flag, the Slovenian flag, and the Croatian flag. And several years ago, we, it's been probably about six years, we started an organization to honor the immigrants that came here, including our grandmothers, because they were all in a group called Serbian Sisters. 
and we wanted to honor the generation and the cultural aspects of their lives and the work that they did because things have changed and there's it's no longer the same cultural community that it once was and our grandparents and our grandmothers were all friends and the organization that they belong to as I said was Serbian Sisters so we decided we would maybe try to have a little uh, reunion and we started out thinking we might have about 25 people who might come to the reunion and uh, 25 turned into 50, 50 to 100, 100 to 150. And on the day we had the reunion, we actually had over 200 people show up. So we knew that there was indeed still interest in the cultural aspects of the Balkan community. And we're Serbian, the three of us are Serbian. And so we decided that maybe we should honor that and form an organization and decided to name it in honor of the original Serbian sisters. And so then what could we do to um, make some community statement? And we came up with planting a Balkan memorial tree, which we did on the north end of Curtis Avenue. And we have a tree lighting at uh, the holiday time for that. And then we decided to do a garden. Serbian Sisters was organized in uh, Belgrade, Serbia. And it was uh, about 1910 or 11 after the First and Second Balkan Wars. And um, at that time, Serbia was war-ridden, the economy was, uh, was battered, people were not in good shape. And so a group of women formed a, a community health organization called Serbian Sisters. And what, it was largely a benefit to the community. Uh, it wasn't politically organized, just uh, a group of women who, who wanted to help people in less for fortunate condition than they were. When the migration effort came to America at the turn of the century, a number of Serbian people came with, and with them their church. And with the church, the Serbian sisters came. And they usually operated out of the church because the church was the focus of, of ethnic activity among Serbs. Serbian Sisters was, is not a religious organization. It happens to be Serbian. The people who belong to Serbian Sisters here in the picture that we have are from many ethnic faiths. Basically, Serbian Sisters was formed to um, help uh, be a social help group to people in uh, poor condition. In 1936, we had the depression here. Things were real poor. And so um, Serbian Sisters was formed. It, um, it passed into uh, oblivion, uh, I think, probably in the 40s or 50s. We didn't know that there was one here. Uh, several years ago, uh, the school district had an all-class reunion, and we decided, well, let's have a Serb reunion. So we put the word out, and then uh, Andrea, a photographer that she is, decided to collect old family pictures from the original immigrants. And this picture showed up. We'd never seen it before. And um, it was an in, kind of an inspiration. Uh, at the all-class reunion, it was it was informal. It was at my house. We just put the word out that uh, we're having a Serb reunion, and we had over 200 people come. And it was we found then there was an identified need that people uh, still want to remember what happened here back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so we uh, formed our own Serbian Sisters, which was a, a, a cultural group. Our first mission, as I said, was to beautify Ironton. <laughs> And from there on, we've moved to heritage. And the heritage of this area is mining for sure. But there are a lot of other miners besides Balkan people. The group Serbian Sisters is actually not just Serbs. It is also Croatians and Italians and a lot of Balkan peoples that lived in the area here. So a lot of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire early in the 20th century then. Uh, people from that region were coming to Ironton, Minnesota to look for work. There were mines opening here pretty regularly. There was a lot of opportunity for people to kind of start new, get a home, uh, live the American dream that we, we all have heard about. Uh, and in the 20th century, this was one of the places where they thought they could achieve it. And now that we are several generations into that, I think in the most part successful American story. These ladies want to again celebrate and reflect the success of many of those immigrant families that came over here with the garden. Many of the Serbian friends of like my parents remain friends for decades and really all their entire lives and I think number one having come from an immigrant family situation so they shared a culture they shared their parents had the language many of the people never 
uh, learned, especially the women, did not necessarily learn to speak uh, English uh, because they didn't have to. They lived in an enclave of people who spoke the same language. Uh, they did not work outside of the home. Um, their husbands worked in the mines in most cases. Um, so many of the women stayed more uh, ethnic, I think, and more culturally centered. And then when their children went to school was many times the first time those kids really learned English. So my dad and my ma's generation were of such that they were bilingual because they had grown up to be Serbian speaking and then when they went to school learned English and then my generation when we came along was a situation where that was kind of the Americanization and you did not want to necessarily think that you had some kind of an ethnic association. Everybody wanted to be an American, so there wasn't much encouragement to speak a language at home. So my, my generation did not learn the fluid language like um, my, my parents had. You know? So I think that that was something with this common uh, language. Uh, I think also the friendships were uh, from the immigrant aspect, but then also from World War, uh, the Depression was another tying type thing for the friendships, everybody shared the, the poverty. And then World War II was something where people, again, shared the sacrifice. And um, so those friendships were formed on, on major life events and you know United States and, and world events. So I think that was a very tight-knit group. And I think that's why um, all of our parents were friends. Um, so we are basically, my daughter now is friends with Lori's daughter, and so we're on the fourth generation of continuing a friendship. Um, and and we, do, we share Serbian Christmas together, which is, by the way, January 7th. Um, and we also celebrate regular Christmas on, on December 25th. But we have made it a, a tradition for our three families to get together on Serbian Christmas. Nothing! Nothing! And we have the traditional food. We have a traditional soup, we have traditional um, main dish, we have traditional desserts, which are like apple pavitica and walnut pavitica, and um, we really treasure that memory. And we, we actually put the pictures on Facebook and people make comments about how they're really hungry for that. And actually, when we had our first uh, reunion we, and we had our, our summer gatherings, we really encourage people to bring ethnic um, recipes uh, made from old family uh, traditions and the things that they were remembering. So it might be something like a bean soup and a bean, um, a kupasa and gra is the name of the soup and that's sauerkraut and beans and that was a staple during the depression. So everybody had that and so that always brings a laugh when pe someone will bring kupasa and gra to the summer gathering. History is a, uh, is a recording of all the events that has been, happened in mankind on our human history. And there are pivotal points and all kinds of big things that happen, and we have history in school, but it seems as though uh, history has fallen by the wayside in, in high school teaching. And I, th I think perhaps it's because maybe kids don't find it relevant. They don't know, how, well, how do they fit into that? You know, and, it's, and you, you can remember those dates that you're told to remember, but two years later you don't know about it because you don't have any framework to hang that on. So um, I, I am a historian, uh, and so I am interested in that. But I'm not interested in every date that there ever was. But I am interested in, in, the, in the parts of history that I'm connected to. And uh, I lived at a, a pivotal, pivotal time here. Um, the first half of the 20th century was the industrialization of America, and, and the place that I came from was played a large part of that. One of the aspects of characteristics of this of our ore deposit here is that we have manganese, and during World War II, um, manganese was needed to make tanks. And uh, World War II was progressing nicely, and Europe was blowing itself up, and it was running out of its own resources. And so, FDR instituted a pro program called Lend Lease, and we supplied Europe with fundamental materials to build, to rebuild, and to um, uh, fight an invading force. And one of the things that came out of the Cuyuna Range was the metal that built the tanks. I watch the military channel a lot, and um, they have a series on historic tank battles of World War II. And one I watched just last weekend was uh, Kursk, 
the tank battle at Kursk. And that was when the Russians turned back the uh, Germans on the German Eastern Front. They gave up. Now, so if Russia had been blown apart, where they get the materials to, to uh, meet the Germans on the field of battle? Well, they had a tank. They had two fleets of tanks, for sure. And they, they met the Germans on, in Kursk, and it was a, a horrific battle. And made Marshal Zhukov brought in a second tier of 300 tanks. And I saw those tanks flying across the steps, the Russian steps. And that was iron ore from Kayuna. That was iron ore from here. That has meaning to me, and that's my heritage. So I will always remember that. When I was growing up, one of the things that I really remember a lot is because we lived um, a, like a half a block from the post office. We had a lot of people stopping in and on a daily basis my entire life. I lived with my grandparents as well. And every day of my life, people came by and stopped. People did not knock. The, no doors were locked. People would come in the back door, and if no one was home, they would walk through the entire house and walk out the front door. And I would be in my room sometimes, and I'd hear somebody coming in the back door, and my grandma or my mom wasn't going to be there, and or wasn't there at the time. And I knew that they'd just walk right through the house, and I didn't have to even go out and say anything. So just the level of trust, and most of it was Serbian people, that there was just that, that level of, of um, comfortable uh, camaraderie with people and people feeling that you could open your house up nobody would ever take anything no one would ever violate anything and so we always had a coffee pot on in the morning for when people went to get coffee so ours was the main stop so I saw people many people all all of my entire life on um, you know several times a week stopping in for coffee in the morning in particular and my grandma too you know never really never really became Americanized and so when I was growing up, that was kind of that awkward time where, you, you know, after World War II and stuff where you really, you know, wanted to be, quote, the American. Um, and I remember coming home and if I had someone with me, my grandma would say something to me in Serbian and then I'd say, oh, Baba, I don't understand. And she knew, of course, that I understood perfectly what she had asked me or what she wanted or whatever, but it was just kind of not wanting to do it. But then later on, I really realized how I thought it was really an incredible gift to be able to have that cultural experience in America. So I feel that I really had kind of the, the best experience. A lot of people my age and, and our age and stuff really never had that kind of experience because they came from uh, generations of people who had already been here. And so to really have a European experience firsthand, and of course I lived with my grandparents, so that was really first, that was a daily dose of firsthand European culture. And so then to go through the Americanization and being fortunate enough to, you know, finish school and, you know, I graduated from the university and so forth. And so that, you know, was just totally almost unheard of for those immigrants. And that's really what they wanted. They really valued education. They wanted their children to do better. And even though my, my dad and my uncles, you know, uh, were done with school in eighth grade, um, they wanted more for their kids. And had the Depression not been part of that, I think that, you know, they would have been able to finish school and so forth. But there wasn't a pressure to finish school during the Depression. And when they needed workers and it was a source of income and there were mouths to feed, it was a whole different kind of thing. And now my niece, who wrote the poem, Her Strength, um, is, has a PhD and um, she uh, teaches in Duluth. And so to go from, you know, grandparents that she, uh, great grandparents that she grew up with, um, not even basically my grandma not speaking much English, for her to be an English professor is just, you know, really would have been such a uh, fulfillment of a dream of those immigrant people who came and said, there's, there's a place in America for my family. This poem was written by Maglina Lubovitch. Uh, her grandparents were uh, Para Vladitich and Mike Lubovich, and she is the daughter of Barbara Cleaver and Stephen Lubovich. She wrote this poem while she was in high school, and the name of this uh, is Her Strength, and she is writing about her grandmother, Para Lubovich, and uh, is called Baba, which is the Serbian name for grandma. These are the days that my Baba takes me down the narrow streets of Ironton. She gently touches my back, laughing. Mi trebamo da idemo brzo. With lips defined, her eyes dark as space, concealed by the night. 
We trudge block after block to visit the women of the old country. She has always been a steady tide, unchanged through time. She sailed from a foreign land, arrived on Ellis Island where she walked across a wooden plank in 1912. Sixty years later, I accompany her days. We drink coffee with women whose faces stay photographed inside the laughs, babushkas, stockings, and Turkish coffee. My Bubba loves each of them, and so do I. Mrs. Ryasich, Mrs. Odonovich, and Soka. I sit cross-legged and listen to stories spoken in their language. When night falls, we prepare for our journey across the neighborhoods with dim light. We pass by houses of American families, all the same they look to us. My Bubba refuses to speak their language, will not accept their ways. They cannot penetrate her spirit. They can only watch as she glows proudly, jeans rejoicing. We must go quickly. Thanks for watching. Join me again next time for another episode of Common Ground. If you have an idea for a Common Ground piece that pertains to North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call us 218-333-3022. To view any episode of Common Ground online, visit us at lptv.org. Order individual segments or entire episodes of Common Ground, please call 218 333 3020. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people on the 4th of November 2008.